Antibiotics are among the most common and most important medications used in modern society, but they also present some serious risks of their own. And the one we're talking about next, many don't know about until it's too late. The link between certain classes of antibiotics like fluoroquinolones and nerve damage is not new. In fact, nerve damage has been listed as a potential side effect of them since 2004. And when I say nerve damage, I'm specifically referring to the risk of severe peripheral neuropathy with their use. This has actually been long established to the point that back in 2013, WebMD recorded reports of long lasting nerve damage and MedPage Today wrote about the FDA's beefed up warning about their use. In July of 2018, yet another warning was issued about the unnecessary use of fluoroquinolones, advising that the serious side effects associated with them generally outweighed the benefits with things like acute sinusitis, bronchitis, and uncomplicated urinary tract infections. And as if this wasn't enough, the safety labeling was then changed to also warn of mental health side effects such as attention deficits, disorientation, agitation, memory impairment, and delirium. An FDA safety review has shown that fluoroquinolones are associated with disabling and potentially permanent serious side effects. Many lawsuits filed on behalf of fluoroquinolone users alleged that the drug companies knew about these risks as far back as the 1990s. Now, as we know, peripheral neuropathy is a condition characterized by damage to the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord. And while it's rarely life-threatening, it can absolutely have life-altering effects. And people experience any number of issues, namely burning, numbness, pain, sensitivity to touch or temperature, such as in small fiber, and spasms, tingling, and weakness. Also, I wanna clarify that for those of you who are hoping I'd single out small fiber neuropathy, I'll remind you that small fiber is a type of peripheral neuropathy. And if you're unsure about the difference, watch these. Now, at the time, the FDA reported a review of data from the Adverse Event Reporting System, which found that peripheral neuropathy continued to rise despite the heightened warnings. The reason appeared to be due to the potential rapid onset and risk of permanence not being adequately described in the initial warning. And PN can occur at any time during treatment with fluoroquinolones and can last for months to even years after they're stopped. And in some cases, it can be permanent. I mean, these are highly prescribed antibiotics and I bet that most of you watching could recall having been prescribed them fairly routinely and even recently for mild to moderate infections. In May of 2023, the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee reminded healthcare professionals that the use of these antibiotics is restricted due to the risk of disabling, long-lasting, and potentially irreversible complications. And although I've focused on fluoroquinolone so far, they're not alone in the potential to cause severely disabling neuropathy, unfortunately. Others include nitrofurans like macrobid, which is a well-known one, and it's commonly used for urinary tract infections. Metronidazole, used frequently to treat bacterial and parasitic infections. Aminoglycosides like gentamicin or tobramycin are used for bacterial infections. Cephalosporins, such as Keflex, is used for respiratory and urinary tract infections. And then sulfonamides such as Bactrim and Silvadine, and the list goes on. I'll include a full list of antibiotic classes that are associated with neuropathy in the description below. So why does this happen with certain antibiotics? What exactly is going on? Theory one is mitochondrial damage. Some studies suggest that fluoroquinolones may interfere with mitochondrial function. 
Mitochondria are the energy producing structures within cells and disruption of them can lead to oxidative stress, which damages nerves. And let's quickly clarify. Oxidative stress is defined as a disturbance in the balance between the production of free radicals and our body's ability to defend against them through the use of antioxidants. And everybody knows antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, lycopene, which is found in ketchup, flavonoids and tannins, which are also found in red wine and tea, phenols found in things like grapes, berries, coffee, green tea, etc. According to Areti, Yera, Nadu, and Kumar, Intracellular oxidative stress can cause peripheral nociceptor sensitization. And nociceptor means pain receptor. So basically, this is saying that oxidative stress in the nerve can cause stimulation of the nerve pain receptors by elevating the levels of substances that produce inflammation. All these metabolic bioenergetic and functional deficits in nerves lead to the development of peripheral nerve damage. All right, theory two, axonal transport disruption. So axons are these tail-like extensions here and fluoroquinolones may interfere with axonal transport, which is the process by which protein molecules such as myosin, dynein and kinesin are transported along the length of a nerve. And here I'm going to paraphrase the following video by USCF professor Ronald Vale, who explains how these motor proteins work and why they're so crucial to our survival. Just like a busy city, there's constant motion inside of your cells. There's new construction, demolition, and most importantly, transporting goods from one place in the cell to another. Cells transport goods along cellular roadways. To transport cargo along these roads, the cells use motor proteins. Kinesin is one of these motor proteins. If you didn't have kinesin and other motor proteins, you simply wouldn't be alive. So the development of new tissues and nerve growth requires molecular motion carried out by these motor proteins. So here you see kinesin has two legs and they walk along a track called a microtubule and get hooked up to cargo, which eventually converts chemical forms of energy or ATP into motion. DNA and all of the building blocks for that nerve cell are made in the brain and spinal cord way up here, but they need to be shipped to the very end of that cell, sometimes a meter away, all the way down by your foot, let's say. Here, you see motor proteins moving their cargo to the cell surface, really incredible. Kinesin moves their cargo from the cell body out to the end of the nerve axon. Dynein moves in the opposite direction and transports cargo from the tip of the nerve axon back towards the nerve cell body or the nucleus. Ultimately, for our purposes, cells complete all of these functions with the sole purpose of converting energy into a usable form. When this is disrupted, our nerves malfunction, leading to impairment and eventual degradation of the nerve itself. Theory three is neurotoxic effects. So fluoroquinolones and other antibiotics have been shown to have direct neurotoxic effects on nerve cells. And these effects can interfere with certain enzymes like acetylcholinesterase, which is responsible for stopping the function of acetylcholine at the nerve synapse here. Acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter used for muscle contraction, but it's also a key player in the autonomic nervous system and can affect memory, heart rate, digestion, arousal, and attention. It's another crucial component of nerve function and these antibiotics can disrupt their normal signal flow. Theory four is immune response. So antibiotic induced peripheral neuropathy may involve an immune response in which a massive amount of inflammation is triggered, which then contributes to nerve damage. This hypothesis is pretty straightforward as we know any type of inflammation is bad. 
Here in this article is one person's account of his experience developing crippling small fiber neuropathy after being prescribed Bactrim and Keflex for an infection that took hold following him getting a tattoo. I highly recommend everyone read this and again, I will link it below. Theory five are drug-drug interactions. So certain antibiotics may interact with other medications enhancing their neurotoxic effects. According to the Peripheral Neuropathy Foundation website, drugs that may cause PN include anti-alcohol drugs or antabuse, anti-convulsants such as dilantin, cancer meds or chemotherapeutic agents like cisplatin, oxyplatin, taxanes, vincristine, immunomodulatory drugs such as thalidomide, immunocheckpoint inhibitors like Optivo and Keytruda, heart or blood pressure medications such as amniodarone, hydrazoline, colchicine, which is for gout, antibiotics, as we've mentioned, which is metronidazole, flagyl, fluoroquinolones, such as Cipro and Levaquin, anti-tuberculosis drugs, such as isonazid, peroxidine, which is vitamin B6, and then finally, calcineurin inhibitors, such as tacrolimus and cyclosporin. And I do want to specifically touch on the antibiotic Bactrim. So Bactrim is a combo drug of sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Trimethoprim inhibits folic acid and sulfamethoxazole is a sulfa antibiotic. So Bactrim is a sulfa antibiotic and folic acid inhibitor combined. The interesting connection here is the role of folic acid in nerve health. It does two very, very important things. It promotes both Schwann cell proliferation and the secretion of nerve growth factor. So Schwann cells play a vital role in maintaining the health of peripheral nerves. Their job is to make myelin and surround the axons with this protective fatty covering to keep them alive and streamline those nerve impulses. Nerve growth factor, on the other hand, is protein which contributes to the growth development and maintenance of sensory and sympathetic nerves, which are directly linked to our ability to feel temperature changes, pain, and tactile sensation. So taking high or long-term doses of an antibiotic that inhibits folic acid is pretty concerning because it can lead to a decreased ability of our nerves to grow and repair themselves. And I actually go into greater detail about nerve growth factor in this video. All right, so now that you know that this can happen, how do you prevent it? Um... So out of the gate, identification of risk factors that may predispose someone to neurotoxicity is imperative and the most important initial step really. These include extremes of age, so either the very young or the elderly, anyone with impaired renal function because the body is not going to process medication as quickly or as efficiently as someone who has normal kidney function, a history of central venous system disease or peripheral nerve disease to begin with, such as MS or CIDP or autoimmune disease. Other important factors to consider are body size. Is this dose appropriate for what's going on? And then finally, are there any other medications that you're taking that may have neurotoxic or nephrotoxic effects? Because if so, adding one of these antibiotics is just going to compound that risk. Now, if you're taking one of these mentioned antibiotic classes and you're feeling any tingling, burning, loss of sensation, weakness, just not feeling right, you want to consult your provider immediately. Symptoms usually present as sensory more than motor and include distal pins and needles sensations, um, burning, stocking, glove type sensory loss. Both small and large fibers can be involved with large fiber involvement presenting as diminished or even absent deep tendon reflexes. Motor nerve involvement 
if present at all early on, is typically less pronounced but can occur later if there's no intervention. And that will usually show up as muscle atrophy and pretty significant weakness. Onset may be insidious and will typically progress if the antibiotic is continued. In most cases, symptoms improve or completely resolve after the offending drug is discontinued, especially if caught early enough, but depending on the circumstances, recovery can also be slow or incomplete if there's been prolonged use, especially. In most cases, timely discontinuation of the antibiotic is sufficient. In severe cases, plasmapheresis may be also beneficial. Future treatments using neurotropins may blunt neurotoxic effects. And if you're saying to yourself, the heck are neurotropins, Danielle? It's nerve growth factor. This is being heavily studied for the treatment of neuropathic pain. In the interim, what can you do to aid your body in recovery? So briefly, managing the issue with over-the-counter supplements has been shown to be extremely helpful in both alleviating the pain and decreasing inflammation to allow the nerves to heal. Many find that taking a combination of R-alpha-lipoic acid and benpatimine, low-dose naltrexone, CoQ10, L-carnitine, creatine, L-carnitine is an amino acid, and things like fish oil also make a massive difference. Increasing intake of anti-inflammatory foods such as greens, turmeric, and healthy fats, as well as cutting down on sugar as much as possible has also been shown to provide relief. There are numerous supplements, dietary changes, and devices that can help with this pain and give your body the space that it needs to recover. So watch these next to find out my recommendations. I'm Danielle Minetti. This has been Lucid Men. And for those viewers that keep messaging me about this t-shirt, <laughs> I love, this is my ultimate, one of my all-time favorite t-shirts by a creator. It's Imagination Brands on Instagram. I will also link that in the description. The creator of these t-shirts has the most insane imagination I have ever seen. I have so many of these t-shirts. I'm gonna wear one each day uh, for each video throughout December. This one's a little past the mark as it's it's Croctober, a little past Croctober, but you gotta love, you gotta love a crocodile holding a crock pot. I mean, can you, can you say anything more? I can't really say anything more about that. Just go check out Imagination Brands.